Welcome back, everyone, to our last session of the day and of the forum. It will be a leadership dialogue on the agri-nutrient industry's innovation drive to mitigate the unfolding food crisis. And to moderate this discussion is Mr. Tim Chain, SVP and Global Head of Fertilizers at Argus. Mr. Chain is a chemical engineer and worked at the Modrafontein Ammonia Facility in South Africa, then as a process engineer at KBR's Ammonia Technology Division in London. He then joined CRU, where he was responsible for the urea forecast services and production cost analysis. Before founding Integer Research in 2003, Integer was a disruptive supplier of fertilizer analytics and forecast services and was acquired by Argus Media in 2018. He now manages the fertilizer sector of Argus, the leader in fertilizer marketing report and forecast services. Mr. Chain, please welcome to the stage. Thank you for that very generous uh, uh, welcome to an introduction, and um, I'd like to thank the organizers and all of you for uh, such an impressive event. This is my first attendance to GPCA. Um, I haven't been to, the, to Riyadh for many years too, so the, this, this week has been a really interesting week, uh, engaging in many meetings and learning from so many experts about the challenges facing the, the chemical industry. I'd also like to thank the organizers for placing a very clear but subliminal message which has pointed towards the topic of this session for the last two days. And I'm talking about this giant molecule that's been slowly rotating in the background. Now, those of you who are in the fertilizer industry or those of you who, the, who are concentrating do, during your uh, chemistry classes at school will recognize that shape, that triangular pyramid. That uh, is an ammonia molecule. I think it's You'd, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better example of chemistry in action, the theme of this conference, than the ammonia, mon the ammonia molecule. Ammonia has been produced industrially for more than 100 years. I think first production was in 1913 in Germany. But the miracle of fi fixating nitrogen from the air, nitrogen being a very stable atmospheric constituent, uh, being able to, to, to draw the nitrogen from the air, fix that with hydrogen molecules, and produce products, downstream fertilizer products, which are accessible by plants, has been a miracle of the 20th century. It was a key component of the Green Revolution, and by most estimates, more than half of global food production is directly connected to this molecule. Many experts believe that global populations wouldn't be able to exceed 4 billion, perhaps even less than 4 billion, if it weren't for nitrogen-based agri-nutrients. So this is really is a miracle of, of, of in industry, of innovation, and of chemistry in action. But as we heard this morning from uh, Fernando and from that video introduction, we still live in a world where we are challenged with poverty, with people going to bed hungry every night, and so there's more to be done. And this is the theme of today's session. By means of introduction, I'd like to take us through a few themes to provide the context for the experts that we have joining us in the panel discussion in a few minutes. This is really all around the looming food crisis. In some cases, we can already say we are in a food crisis. There are many people in the world that are struggling to afford food even as we speak, based on food inflation and energy inflation. But really, I'd like to think about this in, in two senses. The current crisis, which is a real short-term issue which we need to address uh, as an industry and as a community. And then the second, longer-term question, which is how do we ensure food security in the long term, which, which means we need to produce food in a sustainable way. So what's the context? We've heard from many uh, speakers during the last two days that we do live in unprecedented times in the chemical industry and in, in terms of economic environment, and that's certainly true in the agri-nutrients industry. The war in Ukraine had a bigger, bigger impact on the agri-nutrients industry than it had on most other sectors. The direct impact was through the block of flow of products, of, of exports from, from the, the Black Sea region in particular, 
There were also related disruptions due to sanctions, which affected nitrogen fertilizers, but also potash fertilizers from Belarus. And these trade flows were a real imp impediment to getting fertilizers to farmers where they need them. It also had a, a knock-on effect on energy markets because we've seen that huge ramp up in energy prices, especially gas prices in Europe, which has had a crippling effect on the European nitrogen, nitrogen production base. We've had at times more than th two thirds of production idle and much of Europe is currently dependent on ammonia imports rather than domestically produced ammonia because of the cost of gas being prohibitive. That's reorganized the global, com the global cost curve. The competitive environment's completely changed and certainly the industry is having to respond to that in a very agile uh, manner. So this food crisis, of course, it's a combination of, that, of the impact of the, uh, the disruption from the war in Ukraine, but also the lingering effects of COVID. But it, it asks of itself many questions. And some of these questions we'll be discussing in our panel. Questions like, Will fertilizers be allocated to, to customers, to farmers, based on prices, which is the traditional model of a market? Or is more aggressive action needed to get product to some farmers who are in greater need than uh, they can afford fertilizers? And secondly, how will this situation in terms of the, the, the looming food crisis and, the, and the, the challenges faced by farmers result in more efficient use of fertilizers? And we do see quite substantial action being taken in some countries, like in Brazil, to make better use of existing fertilizers, given that traditionally more than half of the applied fertilizers are lost either to the air or to the water, to the ground. So just to unpack some of these topics and to give you a context, because I imagine that some of you are not familiar with this agri-nutrients fertilizer industry, some of you are from the chemicals industry, so we'd love to give you some flavor of the drivers of what matters in the fertilizer sector. Let's firstly look at the short-term issues. And I've charted here a measure of fertilizer prices going back to the early 2000s, the, the last 20 years, just to give you context. And, you, and I, I've charted here some key benchmarks. So uh, fertilizers are dominated by three plant nutrients. So we have the urea Middle East price here, which is a measure, a key benchmark for nitrogen prices. Uh, we have DAP uh, here from, from Saudi, uh, from the beginning of the production of uh, DAP from Marden. Uh, DAP being the, one of the key phosphate benchmarks, the second plant nutrients. We have potash, uh, we measure their potash prices through MOP uh, from Jordan, and ammonia prices, because ammonia will come up later, as also as a key benchmark. Over time, you can see that what ha what's happened there is we've had relatively stable prices, other than the financial crisis in 2008, which saw a steep increase in prices, but the current volatility is far in excess of anything we've seen in the last 20 years, and I think for most, uh, most agri-nutrients participants, this is, a, this is unlike anything we've ever experienced in, my career, in, in, in their careers. And I've been in this sector for 25 years. I've never, never seen anything like this. But let's zoom into the last 18 months. Over this period, we've seen this ramp up in prices, initially driven by uh, some, early, some, some early energy price increases, um, but then we hit the COVID period uh, in early 2022 and we saw an increase, a further increase in prices as government supported food production. So demand, demand came back strong, but there was lots of supply interruptions because of the COVID effects linked to production, linked to project implementation, traded ports and so on. So we had a real ramp up in prices which lasted for a fairly long time all the way through that season in 2020, 21. We've started to see those prices tail off but they're still far above the long-term averages and above the levels we can see with which we, we observed in, uh, uh, in the early stage of, of the, the COVID pro, uh, crisis and even before. So these prices are very difficult to manage for customers, for our, our customers being farmers. And one way we measure uh, the, the comfort level financially of our customers, farmers, is by comparing a, a basket of, uh, of output prices, crop prices, particularly corn, wheat, um, and rice with the cost of a basket of fertilizer imp inputs. We call that the fertilizer affordability index. And you can see there that uh, over that time frame, back to 2015, and actually much before that, fertilizers are very unaffordable in, in comparison to history. 
which means that farmers are struggling to buy fertilizers when they compare the, the price of their inputs with the price of their outputs. We do expect prices to moderate, which is why we see we see fertilizer prices to moderate, which is why we see the affordability improving in the next four or five years. But we, we face a, a fairly long period of uh, relatively inaffordable fertilizer prices. This is in an environment where crop prices are also at historic highs. You can see corn and wheat on the right side, corn and soybeans on the right side, far above uh, historical averages, which means that fertilizer prices are higher in percentage terms than crop prices are. And that's really causing stress to the agricultural community. It's worth mentioning that fertilizer prices, as measured by international benchmarks, are not always the fertilizer prices faced by farmers. There are key, key markets where governments intervene and, and support farmers through, through uh, price support. So, for example, in India, uh, fertilizer prices are far below international averages. Uh, and in China, the government intervenes in, in trade by restricting exports to reduce the price of fertilizers for farmers in China. But many farmers in less protected markets, so in Southeast Asia, in, in Africa, and Latin America in particular, are facing this cost squeeze. So this is a key topic for us to think about as we go into this panel discussion. Then looking at sustainability. There are many aspects to think about in sustainability terms. I've learned a lot about the sustainability ambitions of the, of the uh, chemicals industry. And of course, sustainability is, is a combination of reducing emissions from production and transportation, and then reducing emissions in use. But if you're not familiar with agri-nutrients and fertilizers, you won't perhaps realize that more than half, by most measures, of greenhouse gas emissions from the fertilizer sector are a result of the application of fertilizers on a field. This is, this is predominantly due to the release of, of nitrous oxide, which is produced uh, during the processes of, of applying and using fertilizers. So a key challenge for the fertilizer industry is how to address these what we call scope three emissions with farmers. Um, and we, if we don't tackle these emissions, then it's really going to be counterproductive or not, not effective enough to tackle those emissions that are directly under our control. And we will hear, we'll hear more about scope three emissions and actions we can take as an industry for, as producers from our panel. But of course, we do need to think about the carbon footprint of our production. And the most common topic that comes up in the fertilizer industry when we think about our carbon footprint uh, is the, the most energy intensive of all the fertilizer products by far, which is ammonia production, this molecule up behind me. And a really hot topic, if you had to pick one in our sector, common with, I think, petrochemicals and chemicals and the, and the oil and gas industry is hydrogen. And in particular, the conversion of hydrogen to ammonia. This is our forecast of clean ammonia consumption in the next decades. This is ammonia produced either from fossil-based uh, raw materials and carbon capture and storage, or through the use of renewable energy into electrolyzers, hydrogen, and then ammonia. What I'd like to point to briefly in this chart is maybe working from the long term backwards. In the longer term, on that scale, which is in the hundreds of millions of tons of clean ammonia, we see the biggest application being marine fuels, where Ammonia offers a lot of advantages because of its uh, characteristic of having no carbon. So we think in the long term, ammonia will be the most attractive marine fuel. But there's technology issues, engines aren't ready, big concerns in the marine industry about toxicity of ammonia. So we don't think this, this market will take off in any big way until the mid-2030s. So moving back in time towards the current day, we see other sectors emerging earlier. And the most promising sector is the power generation sector, where we see very committed interest from countries like Japan and Korea to use clean ammonia, co-fired with coal, to reduce the carbon footprint of power generation. And we quite quickly see fives and tens and then twenties and thirties of millions of tons of ammonia being used in power generation in Asia to displace coal. Bearing in mind that ammonia trade globally is currently around 20 million tons, we quite quickly get to the position where just ammonia used in power generation and coal exceeds that amount. And then we have hydrogen, ammonia used as a hydrogen carrier, particularly into Europe, where the European Union has strong ambitions to displace existing energy sources, and ammonia turns out to be the most competitive hydrogen carrier to move, to move energy, renewable energy, into Europe. So we see a big segment of that demand emerging for hydrogen carrier, particularly into Europe and some Asian countries which leaves the, the light gray bar, which is the conventional uses, the current uses of ammonia, 
being, in our view, probably the smallest application of those applications for future clean ammonia. This is a challenge for the fertilizer industry because there's a big need to decarbonize 200 million tons of existing ammonia production. But the fertilizer industry and agri-nutrients players are in a real tension, and this is my last slide. On the one hand, they have an obligation and an ambition to decarbonize their own production, but there are lots of challenges. Firstly, there's no straightforward technology solution. This is going to be expensive. Any way you look at this, this is going to be expensive. A lot of CapEx is going to need to be committed to decarbonize global ammonia production. Secondly, it's not clear how farmers will, be, will, will, have, a, will have the ability to pay for this more expensive low carbon or, or zero carbon fertilizer. And unless there's interventions like we see in Europe, it's going to be quite difficult for fertilizer companies to find business models that allow them to achieve a return on investments of these clean ammonia investments. Thirdly, they have this agenda of having to think about scope three emissions, not just their production emissions, so that requires a lot of attention in itself. And finally, what about urea? Urea is the most widely applied nitrogen fertilizer globally, but it contains carbon. It's the most efficient product way to move nitrogen fertilizer, but unless we can find some non-fossil-based carbon source to produce urea, we're in a real quandary, and a challenge faced by the fertilizer industry is certainly this issue. Big markets like India, Brazil, and Southeast Asia are dependent on urea for their fertilizer needs. On the other hand, and finally, the fertilizer industry, nitrogen producers are very well placed to take advantage of this new interest in clean ammonia, which is valuing the ammonia for the hydrogen content rather than the nitrogen. They have experience, it's a key competency is producing and moving ammonia, and they have lots of opportunity to invest in their existing and new assets. And they're going to have to balance these two needs. So I think we see lots of interesting trade-offs coming in the future, but the trade-off between energy and fuel, sorry, energy and food is such a crucial decision to make that it's going to need to be very carefully considered. So that's my introduction. I've spoken enough, and I'd like to welcome to the, the stage our very esteemed panel. Um, I'd like to welcome, first of all, Haroon Ramatula, um, who's joining us from FertiGlobe. Uh, Haroon is the, C, the Chief Operating Officer of FertiGlobe. He joined the company three years ago, but before then, he was involved in the chemical sector um, in, in investment banking, leading up the chemicals investment banking part of Barclays. So very actively involved in many of these trade-offs and these decisions that are, uh, we face as, a, as an agri-nutrients industry, and he's in a leadership position at FertiGlobe, which he'll tell us more about later. Secondly, I'd like to welcome Mr. Al Sawedi, um, who is the, the CEO of CAFGO. He's been in, in that leadership position for, since 2016. Um, he's, he's had a lot of experience in the, in the, the Gulf uh, petrochemical industry, and particularly uh, at CAFGO, but before that in, GC, in the GCL's business and other sectors. He's also a member of many boards, including the board of GPCA and the International Fertilizer Association. So we're very glad to have his expertise and his insights uh, to join us today. And finally, I'd like to make, welcome Mr. Shamsuddin, who is the CEO of, CAF, sorry, the CEO of Savic Agri-Nutrients. Uh, let me not get confused. Um, a recently formed company, just, a, just almost a year old, which is really separating the Savic uh, Agri-Nutrients business into a new entity, providing lots of exciting opportunities uh, that, that, that that offers to, to the company. Um, and he is also has lots of experience within the SABIC group. He's been responsible in leadership positions for many, many different parts of the business, including, uh, including petrochemicals and upstream in, in previous jobs. So very well placed uh, to guide us through this discussion. So we have a really qualified panel uh, of, of business leaders in the agri-nutrients business. I'd like to welcome them to the stage. Please come and join me. while they take their seats. I think it's an interesting statistic to think about that these three companies, when we look at the numbers, account for almost 30% of world trade in urea. Urea being the most important, one of the most important fertilizers. So very significant presence in global markets, uh, supporting farmers in global, uh, global uh, locations. So we're really looking forward to having this discussion and welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Let's start with some introductions and, and, and opening comments, if we can. Maybe I can start at the end, Haroon. Could we start with you? Could you give us uh, your, your introduction to the company for those who aren't familiar with FertiGlobe? It's a relatively new company, and, uh, and your role. 
Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to integrate fertilizers into the broader agenda uh, on the chemical side. And just on a personal note, <clears throat> you know, I agree with everything that Tim said. We, in the fertilizer space, find ourselves in a situation that is dynamic, uh, that explore, that's offering a number of opportunities for growth. Uh, and also to make a difference. Uh, you know, when I joined uh, Fertiglobe, the key theme at that point of time was, uh, you know, we're, we're contributing significantly to feeding the world, uh, to help improve yields um, um, and help with the food security problem. But also now, we find ourselves in this, uh, in this transition of also helping the decarbonization initiative helping move to a more sustainable, sustainable future. So on a personal note, I get up every morning very excited uh, to, be, to be part of this industry and, and, and to sort of help make the difference. Uh, from, a, from a Fertiglobe standpoint, um, absolutely right, it's, it's a relatively new entity. Um, it, was, it was created three, three years ago, but the assets underlying it are longstanding. Uh, so we are headquartered out of Abu Dhabi. Uh, we are owned by OCI, which is a leading fertilizer producer based out of Netherlands. They own 50%. Adnoc owns 36%, and the remaining 14% is listed in the Abu Dhabi uh, public markets. So our operations: Egypt, Algeria, um, Abu Dhabi. We do 5 million tons urea, a million and a half tons uh, ammonia. Uh, so again. I think uh, here in the GCC region, uh, along with my esteemed colleagues, you know, we believe we're in a good position to help uh, contribute towards these objectives of food security and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Haroon. Um, Mr. Al Sawedi, let's turn to you. Could you introduce uh, CAFCO's role in this industry and, and yourself? Well, first of all, I just want to take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, Jibka for allowing us to participate in, the, in this panel to discuss the importance of the fertilizer. And I have to correct you, Tim, here, 30% uh, production of a nitrogen uh, fertilizer, because fertilizer has too many uh, grades, too many types. So, I just want to emphasize the importance of this region. We uh, contribute to 30% of the nitrogen production worldwide. So uh, we are not far or different than OBEC. OBEC represents 30%, and we are representing 30%. So I just want to emphasize one thing, the importance of this region and the impact on the worldwide uh, urea production and the supply of urea. And I just want to touch base, hopefully, during the discussion with the, the, the difficulties and challenges which we have with regard to the, the, the trade barriers with certain uh, regions. And uh, with regard to, to, to Qatar fertilizer, I'm sorry, we are older than you. <laughs> we are 50 years, we celebrated uh, two, a few years ago, 50 years uh, uh, since inception, but we are uh, learning. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that my uh, brother Abdurrahman on this uh, panel, so we can complement each other and try to bring the best for the audience when it comes to Luria. Luria it's, it's, yeah, we need to explain the importance of re urea, especially if, uh, if we go back uh, with the prediction by 2060, the population will grow from 7 uh, billion to 10 billion. So we need to think now how we're going to feed an additional 3 billion people. And we need to think on, on, on too many areas how we can move forward by trying to decarbonize, and which I don't like, by the way, to use decarbonize, 
because the decarbonization is only one aspect. We need to look at the greenhouse gases. If we're going to focus on only CO2, but the, there is also el, el, el methane and other gases, and we're going to touch those, those ones during our discussion. I will leave the floor to my brother, Abdul Rahman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. al uh, Mr. Ab Abdul Rahman, um, you are also in a leadership position um, at the other of these leading nitrogen producers. Could you give us an introduction to Sabic Agri-Nutrients sure. and, and your role? Thank you, Tim, and uh, Assalamu alaikum. Very good morning. Very uh, pleased and delighted to have this opportunity with also this esteemed panel. Uh, well, we, we are advantages because if we talk about the context of age, we can either capitalize on five decades with the, you know, the legacy SAFCO, or we can say that we are only one year old company yes. because of SAFCO getting new trans January this year. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, well, the, the, the reality that uh, I would like to really add on the, how important is the region for, for the whole globe when it comes to agri-nutrients. Uh, the company has really uh, a strong footprint in terms of really our business and our markets and a major producer also for portfolio of agri-nutrients. But allow me please Tim to zoom into more in the context uh, because it's very important to touch on that context and we're going to talk more about some of these solutions and mitigation. So we start with the context uh, and talking specifically about the food crisis. Uh, generally speaking, uh, sh you know, food shortage and to a certain extent crisis uh, took place and it's a reoccurring event in the world through the history. Uh, but every time the, time the world really managed to overcome it and you know, stabilize. This time, the food crisis comes in the midst of a, a very challenging time uh, because there are two kind of uh, dimensions that are taking place. One dimension, which is very important, that the globe is being strained. When I talk about strained, with all these global uh, uh, geopolitical tensions, conflicts, the climate crisis, uh, with uh, uh, what we are also seeing on the energy transitioning uh, as well. So that's from one side. Coming also after COVID-19, which has really fatigued people, fatigued societies, and fatigued also the physical spaces. This is from one side. The other side as well, you see that there are also headwinds on the global macroeconomics. We talk about the uncontrolled inflation, the high interest rate, as well as also the you know, supply chain uh, bottlenecks as well uh, happening and the deceleration and the slowdown of some economics. So with that put in mind, the food crisis to solve for, for is uh, more complex than before. Now, I don't want to come and tell you that the world will end tomorrow, because that's really not the message to come with, so especially that we have a nice closing that will take place after this panel. But we, I think, in agri-nutrients as a business, we come with a piece of hope, because we think the agri-nutrients can play a vital role for the challenges you highlighted. We can actually bring a, a platform of helping to address the food crisis, the sustainability, and the energy transitioning, provided that we focus on collaboration, Highlighted by my colleague Abdul Rahman and innovation, which we're going to talk more about it. Mm. Thank you. Yes, I think you framed the you framed the, the environment, the context we're in perfectly. So I'd like to start this discussion focusing on the food crisis, and uh, we've had very good background present uh, information earlier today from Fernando and in the video. But we know we're in a world where, by most estimates, more than 800 million people are facing chronic uh, food poverty. Uh, they go to bed hungry at night. We know that food prices are increasing. There's a lot of inflation in food and energy. So we can only assume that the situation is getting worse. This is in a situation where we have the um, Sustainable Development Goals agreed in 2015, which I think one and two are no poverty, no hunger. Um, so yet, these key KPIs are probably moving in the wrong direction. So how do you see uh, the, the future of this food crisis? Do you think we're getting to the end, or do you think we, this is a, an issue that's going to persist into 2023, and how, do, how are you framing that within your business in terms of your response? Um, and maybe we can start with Mr. al uh on this question. Well, f first of all, let's uh, uh, know one thing. The seasonality of the growing uh, fields it's, uh, started, for example, in 2022, we already missed certain uh, timing 
due to the unaffordability of, of, of uh, fertilizer. So what's happened in 22 is just a start. In 23, we will be hit with a, a, a bigger challenge when it comes to a, a food crisis because the season, for example, if I be very specific, in, in Europe, in August, the demand of, of urea starts and it will be up to December. So it will start around 10% of their requirement till 16% by December. So far, shortage, uh, as you are fully aware, 50% of the nitrogen fertilizer facilities shut down in Europe due to the uh, gas prices. So with that in, in, in mind, the prices gone up. El, el other markets within el, el, el worldwide affected. Europe can afford el, el higher prices. Others cannot. If I want to be very specific, I'm talking about Africa and Southeast Asia. Those countries are heavily affected with the unav unaffordability. We need to know one thing, the fertilizer is available, but affordability is the difference. So the crisis of our food crisis shall continue. I will not say should, shall continue in 2023, and it could go with the crisis of, between Russia and Ukraine and the other inflation, post-COVID, it could go uh, up to 2024. But now, يعني, as uh, Abdurrahman said, we need to work together how to mitigate that Im el el if el impact. I will look at the United Nations, and in particular, FAO, and the International Fertilizer Association, they have to take a lead and bring all the stakeholders. The problem so far, those policy makers, regulators, and in particular in Europe, they meet without all the stakeholders and they take a decision. Those decisions, they don't look at the bigger picture, the 360. Like any, recently now, a discussion in, in, in New York in particular, they want to put a, a carbon tax. By providing that tax or imposing that tax on us, it will br uh, push us back to do uh, 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 or look at uh, decarbonization, uh, try to enhance, improve the efficiency, because at the end of the day, we need to work together. By working together, I'm putting a robust plan. If I go back uh, 30 years ago, uh, for example, a CO2 emissions, it was 83, and in 30 years, we reduced only 3%. And imagine post COP 27, they are talking about 2050 to reduce CO2 by to, to, to zero. 30 years, we reduce 3%. In 28 years, you're going to go to zero. Yes, so I think that priority on feeding people um, is, is a very crucial question. Yeah, I, I had discussion with, with friends in, in, in India. Their most, the most important thing for them is to feed the people. <coughs> By imposing those uh, taxes or the, those trade barriers, it, it will aggravate a situation. It will not improve, it will worsen. Yeah. So we need to be realistic in our uh, plan, in our approach. So, and we need, as Abdurrahman said, we need to work together. 
all the stakeholders, whether technology providers, producers, consumers, supply chain, we need to look at, into the 360 and what's the best target and we work on it. <clears throat> just, just a final, uh, to build on, on your description of uh, the situation for food production. Uh, you, you pointed to the reduction in production in Europe, which has pulled in nutrients from uh, other markets. Do you have a sense for how much fertilizer consumption has been lost already in your key markets uh, due to the, the high price and the other lack of availability in some cases, um, and th therefore the, the, the extent to which we might see an impact on crop production in the next season? Do you, do you have any metric on how much uh, demand destruction there's been in key fertilizer consuming markets? Well, to the best of my knowledge, and I have to qualify this, uh, in one of the conferences, I, I think in, in Germany, they, they were quoting around eight to nine million tons per annum right. shortage. <clears throat> so shortage, <laughs> I, I, I imagine that eight million impact yes. on them. On yield, absolutely. Um, Abdurrahman, can you tell us, uh, how do you see this uh, yeah. food crisis issue from the point of view of, of uh, Sabric Agri, Agri Nutrients? Yeah. And, and how long do you think it's going to last? Yeah, well, uh, how long it will last and will it end 2023 or beyond, I would say the best answer is my uh, colleagues, the lawyers answer, it depends. <laughs> yes. Uh, because truly it, depends. It, it really depends on what actions and what decisions we make today. Uh, if we choose that path of, uh, I mean, back again to the point of collaboration, path of uh, uh, protectionism and deglobalization uh, and kind of taking what has been seen in the energy transition in some regions of the world, I believe then we are really calling for more of a snowball effect. Uh, we need to realize that agri-nutrients is responsible for more than 40 to 45 percent of the food grains that we have today in the world. Just one example, if we actually cut the nitrogen-based agri-nutrients in one year, we are basically reducing the harvest by 40% out. So there, the, the solution here would be, again, to that point, is that it depends what, we're gonna, what, what type of really interventions we're going to have. If we say that this is important for us and we need to open up and we need to allow more channels and apply, uh, kind of allow supply chain to be available fertilizer to the right regions, then I think we are moving in the right direction. To your point about the consumption, it's alarming because International you know, Fertilizer Association, IFA, they issued their report, they're saying that over the last two consecutive years, the fertilizer consumption has dropped by this year by 5%, last year by 2.5%. And it continues to that unless because of affordability, mainly and availability of agri-nutrients or fertilizer certain reg in certain regions of the world. So if you see that trend, it's not helping, it's actually firing back. So to that point, I think it's one thing about really how can we really develop collaborative platform that will enable free access and uh, you know, supply chain of agri-nutrients to the right regions at the right time, at the right, of course, uh, price. Also, the decisions we're gonna do about the innovation. Because innovation when it comes to our uh, advanced fertilizer, special fertilizer, fertilizers that will bring um, more yield, so we can use less for more. That's definitely going to be as, uh, one of the solutions. So then we will try to avoid to get into food crisis and truly kind of really e exaggerate even the numbers that we have today, which is 800 million or, or even more. So that in a commitment to innovation and collaboration, those will be, uh, uh, again, the, our enablers to avoid to get into a situation that's worse than what we have today. Yeah, thank you. Um, Harun, how about uh, your perspective on... on Look, I, I, I agree with uh, what, what my colleagues have said over here. I mean, I think my view is when you look at some of these targets to eliminate hunger by 2030, for example, I mean, we are far, far, far away from that. Um, and, you know, I think from a, from a, from a, from a regional perspective over here, uh, the, the three of us, along with some of the other fertilizer producers, I think we're we're doing uh, a fair bit in terms of helping to uh, supply and meet commitments you know to some of these developing nations in the world i mean i think t together the three of us you know we are big suppliers to india 
we are big suppliers, you know, we supply to Africa, Ethiopia, um, uh, and uh, the focus on, um, on making sure, as a point that uh, Abdul Rahman just mentioned, which is, you know, from a fertilizer perspective, the availability of fertilizers is there, right? If you, if you, if you, at least from a regional perspective. So I think this is really a chance uh, for us to kind of showcase what is probably a good business model that we have for each of our companies. I mean, you know, we are on the low end of the cost curve. Um, uh, we, we are able to, uh, uh, from a from a consistency perspective, supply two uh, key countries through the cycle. Uh, we're reliable partners um, as we think about, you know, in all our interactions, and I'm sure my colleagues get this as well, you know, we have interactions at the highest levels, at government levels, uh, uh, with our businesses, which is ensuring that supply of fertilizer is the most important thing. You know, they, they, they often tell us, don't worry whether money will be available or not. Fertilizers is, is what we will ensure, is what we will ensure is, is from, a, from a demographic perspective, uh, is something that's, that's, that's extremely important. So I guess, you know, just to add uh, to what was said earlier, uh, yes, you know, I, I do think the, the food crisis uh, is sort of here to stay. Uh, uh, a lot depends on some of these initiatives that are going to come into play. I personally have said that uh, in the U.S., you know, and this kind of ties into a little bit on the sustainability side, but also the, the initiative on the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, that has been a game changer uh, because what you're going to see now is increased production of, of ammonia, uh, and that means ammonia for fuel, ammonia for fertilizers, uh, because of that policy-led initiative from the U.S. government. Canada is, is, is following uh, as well and the European Union is in the middle of some discussions, you know, I think they tend to move um, uh, not as fast as, 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 as the North Americans. So I think in all of this, having this policy uh, support to help sort that food crisis is going, to be, is going to be pretty key because at the end, the economics must make, the economics must make sense on a long-term perspective. And for these early stage, um, you think about blue, uh, ammonia or green uh, ammonia, you know, to get this industry off the ground, there must be that intersection of government, uh, private, the government uh, sector, the private sector, and, and all of the financial intermediaries in between to support it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Arun. I'd like to hold the, um, the topic of the investments in that sustainable ammonia production for a few minutes and just fo keep focusing on the food production side. Uh, you, you, you pointed to collaboration as an, a key issue, and it's been a big theme of this event, uh, is talking about collaborating through the supply chain and with stakeholders. Um, is this food crisis pushing you and encouraging you to collaborate more with downstream partners in target markets in Africa and Asia and wherever you're selling your fertilizers or with governments? And, and, and what, you know, what are the levers that you can pull to make sure that fertilizers that are available actually reach small-scale farmers in Africa or uh, farmers that are not particularly connected to the global system but need the nutrients. Harun, could you maybe just build in? Uh, on yeah, that sure. I think, look, innovation is, a, is, is part of the key over here. Um, as you touched upon in your presentation, you know, a significant portion of fertilizers is lost uh, in the application. Um, and um, one of the things that, uh, that we're focused on that kind of helps to ensure that you have the right amount of fertilizer at the right time and used most efficiently. I think a big part of that is the technology and the innovation uh, that, that goes into it. And uh, I, uh, you know, within the industry, uh, we see a, a lot of collaboration as we think about you know, slow release fertilizers or we think about using fertilizers with inhibitors. Uh, and that also, by the way, you know, all of this, I think the most interesting part is the the, the, the discussion is all coming together from very different aspects as well. Because, you know, as you make fertilizers or with slow release or with um, inhibitors, you're also he helping your scope three. You're also helping your scope three um, emissions. So the, 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 this, this, um, this topic is all becoming intertwined right now where it's not just 
it's not just about, uh, you know, um, uh, this, uh, the, the sustainability aspect or it's just not about how you produce it. It's, it's achieving more than, more than, one, more than one, uh, one perspective. Absolutely. Doing more with less is, it seems to be a, an accelerated topic um, which uh, the fertilizer industry is having to accelerate. Um, Mr. Al Sawedi, I wanted to talk through something you mentioned earlier, which is uh, the, some of the responses to the disruptions we've had have been really moving against trade. Some protectionist measures, some countries um, trying to uh, protect their farmers by re re changing or reducing exports, for, for example, from China. Um, uh, just generally, some protectionist measures, more nationalistic measures we see. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you think we should be approaching that? Um, and you know, what, where should the world be heading towards in terms of uh, trade of fertilizers and uh, the, you know, the, the philosophy we, we, we approach towards um, fertilizer trade in particular? What, you know, what's your position on that? Do you, do you think we're going in the wrong direction? Well, frankly speaking, we, we first, f first of all, if I uh, go back to the comment which uh, raised by uh, my, my colleague Haroun, if you want to make a fertilizer available, uh, affordable to, to, to uh, for example, Africa, resolve the conflict. And when I say the conflict, it's not only the conflicts between uh, Russia and Ukraine, it also the conflicts between America or US and China, between the others. So this is one thing which uh, escalated or inflated the prices. A second, pushing for uh, a quick transition, a quick transition in terms of a decarbonization. My personal view, people must understand, now they are talking about decarbonization. And they are overlooking that there are a lot of countries just started to carbonize. <laughs> Lebanon, Cyprus, close by. They just uh, found out the, the, the new fields and they try to uh, develop. They will try to build the facility. Do you think they will think of a, a decarbonization at this stage? No. Mm. So if I go back again, and I want to highlight one thing, policy makers, regulators must listen to the industry, must involve the industry. We need to work together. We need to work together and put a robust, practical plan. Somebody is highlighting about renewable energy, batteries. Did anyone look at the full cycle of a battery? My colleague here, Nadia Al-Hajji, highlighted that in our uh, meeting. Nobody thought of the batteries, the impact. <coughs> Can you imagine in 10 years' time what, how we're going to dispose 100 million or 200 million batteries? The question I want to, uh, or the point I want to uh, emphasize or highlight, any decision we take, we need to be wise enough, looking at it 360, mm -hmm. involve all the stakeholders, then we move forward. forward. We must ensure a buy-in, a buy-in of everyone. If we want, to achieve a target. Yes, you point to that crucial issue of avoiding unintended consequences, which is yes. uh, a real danger when we think about f food production and hunger. We can't have a world where we increase uh, sustainability at the cost of making more people starve. Uh, I don't think anyone would think this would be a good ambition. So that's a really great point you make. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Shamsuddin, could I ask you um, how, how you think uh, the fertilizer market is structured and, and do you think protectionism is, is, a, is a barrier to making fertilizer available to, to uh, farmers that need it? Yeah. Yeah, what, maybe to, to address that point first, it's important to see the, just kind of really to ma imagine the, the current world map when it comes really to the food uh, value chain. Uh, when it comes to agri-nutrients, agri-nutrients from a production perspective is concentrated where basically as you highlighted, nitrogen base, potassium, and phosphate. So for the nitrogen, you get it more concentrated where uh, feedstock and natural resources regions are. So our region is, is one of them, US, uh, Russia. When it comes to you know, phosphate and potash, they are basically mined. So you're going to see the concentration of production in those countries where you have really uh, local reserves for phosphate, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Morocco, uh, US, as well as also KSA and other parts of the world and potash, other countries. That's from production perspective. You look at actually where the consumption goes, the key agricultural regions, they are somehow different regions. Southeast Asia, India, Africa, Latin America. If you take that further as well, to talk at the food uh, value chain, we talk about the essential grains for rice, for example. 15 countries worldwide are responsible for 90% of the global trade of rice. The, five, the top five wheat exporters, they are almost existing in different hemisphere than the top five importers of wheat. The point I want to make, that if you look at the value chain, generally speaking, countries and regions, some are in, can offer and others in need of something. So this whole, again, to talk about protectionism and what you said there, what we will, if we would like really to solve this problem, we need to open up. We need to have channels of keeping this free trade when it comes to the food value chain, including the agri-nutrients. Excluding, if you are apart from probably China and Russia, who you can classify as self-sufficient, no one region, no one country can solve this in isolation. That's very important. Now, from the other side, I think we as an industry, we need to tell our story in a different way. I think I would totally agree with my colleagues, Abdurrahman, this, that we have to create the buy-in. So we need to, to bring and, and, and write the narratives and say the narratives about the industry, how we are part of that solution, how we are at the right side of the history, including how much we are innovating to uh, get you know, more efficient fertilizer, more sustainable fertilizer, that's something we need really to focus on. The industry generally we've been, I would say, historically inward focus. Mm. It's time that we start to be outward focus and tell our story to the stakeholders so we can improve the situation. Mm. We, in many ways, we have some of the key tools to solving the food crisis. We have the, the, the methods in our hands and uh, if these are shared and used more widely, we can achieve the objectives. Absolutely agree. Let's turn towards sustainability, um, if we can, and I know the audience would be very interest, interested to hear from you uh, about the plans your companies have to reduce your greenhouse gas footprint. Um, you know, uh, what I'd like to ask you is, have you, have you made commitments to, by particular dates, and you know, what do you have in your project pipeline to achieve uh, a reduction uh, in, in your CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, maybe we can start um, with you, Abdul Rahman. Okay, sure. Uh, first of all, let's uh, talk about the, the general context and then I'll talk about our yes. commitment to that. Uh, it's the whole sustainability and decarbonization or, or DG, HGs, uh, to the point of Abdul Rahman, uh, is, is a commitment and our industry has to shift and it started really to make some, which is the good news. Uh, most of our, uh, the players in the agri nutrients business started to make that commitment with tangible actions on the ground. Uh, many committed to this carbon neutrality between the time span of 20, 2040, 2050, with some interim targets by 2030. I also hear my colleagues, Abdurrahman, saying that we need to be practical about it. I, I totally, totally support that. But I think that commitment is there. We see the move towards that direction. We see the commitment taking place. Another thing that happening there in, this, in our industry as well, which has been a highlight for the world, is the blue ammonia and our contribution to the blue ammonia. Now, to our bride here in the region, the first actually certified uh, blue ammonia independently, commercial scale, was a produce here in, in, uh, in, in the GCC in the region. It was a collaboration between Aramco and uh, Sabica Green Nutrients. 
so, so we are making moves, and we are in certain areas where even first movers. Now, making it to the next level, uh, we need to really commit to innovation, uh, because that's going to be a, a differentiator for us to achieve the targets, to be realistic, and really to walk the talk. We have great opportunities when it comes to our scope one and scope two. Uh, I think that's a challenge that everybody has, but I believe we have a good handle on that, and we have our plans for going uh, for uh, carbon neutrality. Scope three, as you highlighted, is a big challenge for the industry, especially for nitrogen-based fertilizers, agri-neutrons. As you highlighted, 50%. It can reach even to 70 80%. Depends on kind of what type of portfolio you have there. So again, focusing on the innovation of our products. How can we bring those solutions that will bring less emissions? Nutrition effect, so we get higher yield through inhib inhibitors or slow release and uh, also bio, uh, you know, advanced fertilizer. So I think we are on the right track. Uh, we have uh, strong actions on the ground. We have some first moves. When we talk about sustainability, we need to commit more to innovation. Just to build on your, uh, the information you, you're sharing about the, the, the first mover, you, you've had some early certified <coughs> blue ammonia shipments. Can you, can you tell us uh, more about what they were? Did, was that an early production of ammonia with carbon capture, or did you have some other offsets? Correct. Um, how did you achieve that so early? Because it really is early in the, that's, in the, in the landscape. That's, that's a great point. So one thing that may be good to, for uh, you know, the audience who don't uh, know the industry, I mean, in details, uh, the, the, the carbon capture and utilization is almost embedded in the DNA of the agri neutrons when it comes to nitrogen. Because actually the process itself, we are capturing the you know, carbon dioxide from the upstream, which is the ammonia production, and capture it, sanitize it, and use it in the downstream, which is the urea there. So the, the CCU kind of concept has been there for, for decades in the in the industry itself. So that's built in uh, in agri-neutrons, particularly for nitrogen. So to your point, we basically utilized that concept of CCU, and we have uh, uh, made our uh, production there where we capture the carbon and make sure that it goes into uh, utilization. That's been uh, uh, certified utilization as well. And based on that, we get really the right quantity of production to be blue ammonia being certified by TUV. Mm -hmm. And I imagine this will be a growing area that you expand uh, as, as, Ab as absolutely over time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Al Sawedi, how about Kafka? What, what plans do you have in terms of uh, or DGHGing uh, your your business? <laughs> <laughs> to use your term. <laughs> well, to, to to again to start with, I'm I'm very proud uh, first of all, and to congratulate uh, Sabak Agri Nutrients for the first our shipment certified as a blue ammonia. So we at uh, Kafco, as you are fully aware, we uh, awarded the contract for the biggest uh, blue ammonia facility with uh, 1.2 million ton per annum uh, blue ammonia. And, uh, we're going to sequestrate, or for non-technical, we inject uh, about 1.4 million ton of, of CO2. So the uh, contract awarded, we're going to be uh, hopefully commissioned the facility by first quarter 2026. And th that one was at the, the start. Already we have an uh, aggressive plan with regard to sustainability. The way we look at it from, uh, from Kafka uh, perspective, we don't look at, again, the CO2, we look at the greenhouse gases, uh, to how we mitigate to, to, to zero the methane uh, emission, whether fugitives, uh, methane, or, or, or others, the SOX and the NOx. People sometimes overlook those two uh, gases so we have a plan to, to, to go to a minimum practical. And I have to be here very cautious by saying zero, because so far the technology available, we cannot achieve zero in everything. But I'm, I'm so glad that by 2028, Kafka, all 
gas feed stock, the first backup and second backup will be sweet gas. So we're going to knock the socks. The knocks already we do have, uh, again, a, a plan to uh, reduce it to minimal, and we're going to remain with CO2. CO2, we do have, uh, as I said, uh, aggressive plan to reduce it, but uh, I want to emphasize here that by 2050, we shall not achieve zero. So you're emphasizing the pragmatic approach we need to yes. take, um, not at any cost. I think that's... Uh, if somebody wants to ask me why you, are, you, you say you utilize shell, shell means, and in legal terms, is, is something very firm. If I want to go to zero, that one will be at a cost. Can you afford that ton of uh, ammonia or urea with three, four times the market price? I doubt it. So we need to be practical. And we don't want to give promises where we cannot meet. We want to be realistic. A challenging target, the moment we achieve, or before achieving that target, we're going to set another target. I think your uh, confirmation of, the, the, I think, the first large-scale uh, purpose-built uh, low-carbon ammonia plant is a very exciting step in the right direction and, and really uh, putting your, act, you know, your, your, your bank balance uh, on the line to demonstrate your commitment. Um, and th that's a really good signal. Um, Haroon, how about uh, Fertiglobe? How do you, what are your commitments to DGHG in your so, business? So this is uh, front and center for us. Um, and uh, you know, as we think about our own GHG intensity profile, you know, there are different levers to achieve that GHG, to achieve a better GHG score or intensity factor. One is, you know, starting with some of the low-hanging fruit. When you run your plants efficiently, when you have less uh, stops and starts, uh, what you're doing is just being much more efficient with the gas and the CO2 that's produced. Uh, so as an industry, you know, making sure that we are running our plants in a completely optimized way achieves two objectives. One, it helps us ensure our own economics make sense. And two, it ensures that our GHG emissions are reduced relative to a producer, you know, that has a much lower operating profile. So that's kind of our, our strategy for the low hanging uh, uh, part of it. The second element, you know, just as, uh, just as uh, both the Abdul Rahmans have mentioned, you know, Fertiglobe as well is very focused on, on, on the, the path to, I say, low or no carbon. Uh, and again, you know, re-emphasizing the themes uh, that was mentioned, the projects need to make sense, right? We, uh, um, uh, you know, either with our public shareholders or our private shareholders, you know, have an obligation to ensure that these projects are sustainable long term. Mm -hmm. So our approach is also very similar. And this, again, plays in to some of the advantages that the GCC region offers. Because when you think about blue ammonia, right, uh, the, the region here has a significant, uh, has a significant advantage. Um, we are, uh, will be uh, uh, in the middle of uh, Q1 of next year. Uh, looking at an FID of a million ton um, blue, uh, so I would say low carbon uh, ammonia uh, project um, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so we expect to, to give an update uh, to that to the markets uh, uh, in the next quarter. Uh, I would say the other element, of course, also is we have started making small steps on the green side. Uh, so I was in COP27 uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we announced um, uh, or showcased, uh, uh, you know, 5 to 15 megawatt, it's small, but a 5 to 15 megawatt green uh, hydrogen project. We're in the middle of commissioning it. And what we like about it, is especially I think this applies to all of us as producers, is we have that back-end infrastructure. Mm. 
You see, we need to inject a hydrogen stream, whether it's blue or green, but the advantage that we as incumbents have in this space is we have that back-end infrastructure. We're missing either that electrolyzer piece or, uh, or the, the CCS or the CCU aspect of it. So that puts us at a, at a significant advantage versus others and, are, and in a position we're able to deliver more quicker, I would say, on targets than some of our, than some of our other peers. So at COP27, we announced this 5 to 15 megawatt uh, green project uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, we have actually, um, uh, you know, in the process of, of uh, injecting that hydrogen stream as well pretty soon. Um, we're also looking uh, at uh, a feasibility of another green project in, in Abu Dhabi. And again, I go back to the point that I made earlier. You know, blue right now from an economics perspective makes a lot of sense. Our approach in the green until the economics um, are clear is to take, you know, more measured steps to see um, whether we are able to get that premium uh, that would justify uh, the cost of, of producing green. You know, there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty right now. How do the green economics, who's going to build the green plant, uh, you know, uh, yeah, how do you, how do you factor in a, a, from a project perspective, you know, a green project if you don't know what that, if you don't know what the regulation is or if you don't know uh, whether there's a customer that's going to pay for that. So, Yes, yeah, so, you know, so to summarize, yeah, look, we've got a pretty uh, large project that we're evaluating on the blue, um, um, smaller, more measured um, in, uh, projects um, in uh, Abu Dhabi and Egypt. And I come back to the advantage that the GCC region ha has, as well as the broader MENA, re MENA region as well. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a number of inherent advantages, and back to um, uh, Abdul Rahman's point of they're being exporters and they're being importers. You know, there are, um, uh, because of our export capacity, because of that inherent infrastructure that we have already on the back end, the region is in a, is, is, is in a leadership position um, to service key markets. I mean, we can get to the Asian market uh, relatively um, easily. In the case of Fertiglobe, you know, with our plants in North Africa, we're also able to access the European market. So, you know, it, the, the location, the region, uh, I think has a number of advantages that I think positions us to take a leadership role uh, to, and you know, congratulations uh, on, on, the, on the certifiable shipment as well, uh, to take a leadership role on, uh, on, a lot of these, uh, on a lot of these initiatives. Yeah, Har Harun, um, the, before we turn to the slider questions, just I'd like to build on a theme you've mentioned because it's crucial. Uh, we, we, I think we all agree that the agri-food business is, by its nature, completely global. Uh, the inputs and the crops themselves need to be traded internationally. Um, there's no way to feed the global population any other way. But in the GCC, we have the resources to be a, a leading player in both the conventional blue, let's call it, um, for the lack of a better term, and also green. We have the renewable uh, energy resources, uh, solar particularly. Um, so the, Ab the Abdul Rahmans, uh, either of you, could you, could you comment on how you think uh, this business will develop in terms of which of these types of ammonia will, will be most important in the next decade, for example? Do you think that uh, blue ammonia will, will, will be more important um, or, or will green dominate, given that the region has advantages in, uh, in both of these products? Either of you? Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to highlight one thing about our uh, project. Our project, the blue ammonia uh, plant, powered 100% solar. Ah. So the, the 37 megawatt will be solar uh, energy. Let's, I, I can give you just a very high uh, level estimation. The blue versus the green. The green, the, you are to depend on the prices from one region to the other. There are a number of factors affecting the, the, the figure which I'm going to highlight. L l estimations between 3500 I mean, $3, to $4,000 per ton. Do you think anyone can afford that? No. So 
is, and will not obstruct us of trying to develop the technology further, try to reduce the green uh, ammonia. Today, it, it's, it's quite impossible. But the beauty of our industry, impossible today, tomorrow can be achieved. And I think there are a number of initiatives within the GCC. Uh, they are working on blue, uh, sorry, green ammonia. But the current stage, next 10, 15 years, blue ammonia, which can be affordable. And with time, it will be the, the, the cost will be improved and can be afforded by too many companies rather than a famous three or four countries worldwide. Yes, exactly. Rahman. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to add to that point, we're zooming into the, to the region here, the GCC. Uh, I believe, uh, to the, again, supporting the point, we have all what it takes to uh, move to the next chapter. Uh, we have, and this is not wishful thinking, we have, we have profit, we have a track record of doing it. Look at GBCA, and look at you know, the petrochemical industry, for example, over the last five decades, where we started and where we are today. The same for agri where we started and today we, are, we talk about 30% of it. So uh, I guess we are, we are a region that moves into delivery and we being a first mover even in this blue ammonia is, is not about announcement, it's about really delivering on the ground. So we have all what it takes there. I, I, I would like to highlight as well collaboration. In this region, we have an excellent example of collaboration. GBCA and particular agri nutrients. we have the agri nutrients Committee. Regional collaboration, but really with a global agenda. So how can we serve really the global agenda? How can we provide sustainable agri nutrients that goes to the, you know, the right agriculture regions that in need for agri nutrients and the need of our, our solutions? So maybe just to conclude this point, I think it's indeed right and the testimony for what's been said by uh, you know, His Highness Prince Abdul Aziz. This is land of hope and determination. Absolutely, and um, we can see the, uh, the, the role and the, the importance of GCC supply um, only increasing in the future. Uh, I think we should be uh, respect the democ democratic wishes of the audience and consider some, uh, <laughs> some questions from, uh, from Slido. So uh, let's start with the top question. Um, it's how are agri-nutrients balance, agri-nutrients producers, I guess, balancing their profit profitability versus food price inflation? And how do we, how, how do we balance these dimensions fairly? I guess, uh, uh, implying or, or hint, you know, connecting to the point that um, current fertilizer prices mean very good financial performance. So how do you balance your obligations to society with your financial, uh, the results you're achieving financially? Would you like to start? You, uh, <laughs> it's a hard question. <laughs> well, uh, let me give it a trial. Uh, and of course, well, it's, it's, uh, we, we are not, the price is there for agri nutrients. It goes through really the, again, the fundamental supply and demand and all of the situation in their market, geopolitical and what have you. I think what we should be talking about more of exactly at this point about what we can do to help the situation. Yeah. Back to the point that we are really working hard of how can we be more uh, uh, innovative in producing uh, efficient fertilizer. A fertilizer that then the farmers or the customers, the growers can use less for more. So that's eventually getting there business model to be more viable. At the same time, we are uh, being, an, and again to the point of Harun, we've been uh, uh, building a very efficient and effective supply chain network over the, the last uh, you know, four, four plus uh, decades. So we're also trying to get our products and our solutions to the customers at the most efficient, you know, cost-wise uh, uh, mean. So that also helping the, uh, the viability and also kind of really to sustain the, the downstream, the downstream, uh, downstream business. Uh, back to the point of uh, uh, profitability of it. Uh, again, we have, I think, we have a, a role to be played by uh, the regulators and also the the policy makers, because if we also introduce more barriers and uh, to really to the agri nutrients to get into the region, there's additional costs there that gonna come down to the downstream, which is hurting really the industry and hurting the, hurting the downstream, the food uh, processing and also the, the farmers more than what it helps. Mm. 
So they, I think these are the collective efforts that we are talking about it, and this is the role that we are playing in agri-nutrients. Mm, thank you. Uh, Mr. El Sawedi, how, how do you think about this question? Well, for, first of all, uh, I see it over and above what uh, Abdurrahman said, el, 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 el farmer awareness. The farmer, by the way, if we, if we go back to Asia in general, the efficiency of the utilization of urea is 30%, whereas, whereas in, in, in North America, 70%. So 40% difference. Can we enhance the awareness of those farmers small farmers of the utilization of urea first. Second, again, going back to what Adrahman said, if we can move gradually from conventional urea onto high efficiency, high efficiency or a slow release, that one will improve uh, uh, I cannot tell how many depend on the soil condition, but you could see 10, 15, 20% improvement on the uh, efficiency of, 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 of urea. So to me, to, to start with, one of our obligation as, as an industry, along with the governments, is to enhance the awareness of the farmers about the urea utilization. And imagine still in certain countries worldwide, I don't want to spec uh, be very specific uh, with, with the regions, they are utilizing a conventional way by throwing a urea. This is a very low efficient uh, utilization because you could end up of putting a lot of urea in one area and shortage of one. We need to uh, improve the greenhouses and the hydroponic uh, technology because we did a test in Qatar along with uh, some of the companies and we could improve the yield by six times. So six times that will improve or lower the price of the food. So there are a lot of ways, but what's lacking, I mean, we need to work together. Absolutely. Um, the, this question of using innovative products like slow release plus uh, better application practices would uh, achieve very big cost savings for, uh, for farmers. Yeah. If you just allow me to build on the same, but that's an excellent point as well. Uh, back to the collaboration. We need to collaborate through the whole value chain. We need to sit on the table and see how can we help the downstream, what we can learn and what we can also offer them to learn through this value chain. The best application of it, I think, is an excellent point by Abdurrahman. Uh, uh, the farming practices, uh, the smart farming, uh, digitalization on this application. We have a lot of being in this business uh, of sophistication, I would say, that we can help the downstream, but providing this collaborative, collaborative platform that we can help the downstream and, and uh, promote more on, on the food, uh, food yield and food security. Yeah, and of course it links to sustainability if products are used more effectively. Haroon, how do you th think about uh, your role to, to your customers against um, the, the financial returns to shareholders? You know, it's, it's, it's all, uh, I think it's, as, as, was, as was mentioned, it's all about that education exercise uh, with that end farmer. Because as we think about, as we think about, and in many ways, documenting the efficacy of switching from a product A to product A plus an in inhibitor or product A plus a slow release. Because farmers generally from a mentality perspective tend to be very resistant to change, right? You come, you come to them with a new product, they're going to say no. Um, so the, this, you know, what we're focusing on as we think about some of these, these, these new products, the slow release or the inhibitors and other innovation is supporting it with the proper uh, trials, uh, the, the scientific data that clearly lays out the advantages on the yield, clearly lays out on the advantages on use and timing. 
So I think that's, that's kind of how we're, how we're looking at it. Um, and of course, that takes a little bit of time, right? Um, so this move, you know, sh has to be started or has already started, um, but will take a bit of time for the farmer to actually make that change. Yeah. Uh, and, and that collaboration, uh, the communication uh, is going to be part of that journey um, that is not only something that falls on the hands of the fertilizer producers, right? It is, uh, Abdul Rahman's point as well, it is a joint effort through the value chain to bring about those changes in uh, consumption patterns or, or use. Uh, so it's very much, very much a collaborative effort, but that's how we are kind of approaching it as we think about this transition uh, to these products. Yeah, exactly. So I think in summary, it's collaboration, uh, getting closer to customers uh, through partners or even with digital tools. Every farmer has a mobile phone in their pockets. So I think we'll see lots of innovation in this area. Um, let's move to the next question. Um, how do you see the upcoming competition? Uh, this is a good question, but between ammonia for fertilizers and ammonia as an energy carrier, uh, the food versus fuel debate. Do you think that the, 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 the draw of ammonia being used as a fuel will, will uh, have an impact on fertilizer prices even by drawing ammonia across to the fuel applications? Um, and do, is that something we should think about protecting from policy, um, about policy measures? I'll open that to any of you. Yeah. Uh, no, look, I, I, I think uh, um, when you look at the potential demand uh, vectors, yeah, as, uh, and uh, you talked about this a little bit, Tim, I mean, I think the power side is, is one where we see a lot of, a lot of potential, potential demand. I mean, we speak to customers uh, in, in Asia, and that move is already happening. Right? I mean, they are testing uh, co-firing. They're moving ahead with it. So that demand is, is real. Um, so, you know, I do believe that the pricing of that kind of, you know, demand for power versus demand for marine, I think that's something that will evolve. Because when you look at the power side of things, who's the end customer? In Japan, the end customer are, you know, local consumers, right? So there needs to be some element of, I would say, a subsidy uh, to encourage uh, that use. Uh, so, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, to answer, that, to answer that question, it's a bit, it's complicated right now. It's, it's very difficult, it's very difficult to say that the market's definitely <coughs> going to move in one particular dis uh, uh, direction from a pricing standpoint. We see uh, the demand potential as quite significant, that's what we're all gearing towards. But at the same time, if you see the supply side, a lot of people have announced projects. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, uh, now there's an open question of whether those projects will actually happen or not. Uh, but there is, there is, um, there is this, uh, the tons of announcements, blue, um, you know, some green. The US IRA, for example, is going to result in a lot of exportable, as we were discussing this morning, exportable supply. Um, so in terms of that, how that all finally ends up, I think it's a bit difficult to say. I think at the worst case, there might be a time lag. You know, as regulation becomes clear, depending if the demand profile comes ahead of that supply profile, you might have a period of three to four years for capacity to ramp up to meet that demand. Um, uh, so I think at the worst case, we have, we have, a, we have a time lag um, as this industry evolves. Yeah. And inevitably, we, we might see a connection between ammonia prices and fossil fuel prices because there'll be trade-offs uh, yeah. you know, of crude or coal or other prices go up, uh, the substitution in, in yeah. the long term. So uh, there's going to be a very different market structure. Do you, do you, yeah, Mr. Alcawedi, please. <coughs> go ahead. The way I see el, 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 el ammonia, whether it will be going to produce urea or utilize as a power, one of the major factors trade barriers. Mm. Trade barriers, if we shall not overcome those trade barriers, you are pushing me to divert the ammonia into the power. Because you are extracting part of my potential profit. In fertilizer, potentially. And let me be very clear and transparent here. 
you are extracting that percentage from my profit because you don't want to improve your plant efficiency. You want to protect your region, your area, and you want to impose on the low producers a more efficient. And if I compare this region with too many regions worldwide, we have the latest technology, the newest facility, so our efficiency is higher. And we do have too many studies which uh, ex yeah, evaluated a food carbon footprint. Our facilities are way below Europe. Way below Europe. So, but you know, with my full respect, the European, they focus at certain areas. They do have their, and if I'm on, the, uh, uh, on their side, I will also try to protect my region. But they focus on certain areas that this is the most important. But look at the complete chain. Our carbon footprint is way below the Western. So we are more efficient. And why we are more efficient? Because our facility are new, latest technology, and honestly speaking, Tim, we do spend a lot of money to enhance the performance. And I'm very confident all companies in this region, if they don't conduct a benchmark annual, biannual. So in summary, if regulators worldwide policymakers will not try to go back for a free trade we're going to be forced to move to bar yeah, di yeah. diverting products mm -hmm. from food so there is a really a fuel versus food uh, debate or or decision to be made in that case. Yeah. Uh, f we're nearly out of time, but finally, Abdul Rahman. I, I'll just try to make it uh, quick. Uh, look at, we have seen this intersection between the energy value chain and the food value chain before. I mean, or look at the biofuel and what have you. Biofuels. Now we are getting to be more connected at the hip there with the ammonia as a building block. I look at it not a competition or not a tension. I look at it as an opportunity to grow. You highlighted we have about 200 million metric ton of ammonia production worldwide. 10% of that has been traded, and the rest is captive use. What's been announced today by 2050, in only about two and a half decades, is about another 200 million ton of ammonia. That's almost double what we had really built over the last period of time. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to grow. I think that we're going to get into a balanced uh, situation eventually. There are lots of uncertainties going with that, but it's also a call for it's time to grow. And ammonia here is providing an opportunity in addition to decarbonization impact, which is also something we're looking for. Mm. Uh, thank you, Abdul Rahman. Uh, we have reached the end of our available time. I actually had uh, many of more of my own questions mm -hmm. and more questions from the audience. So we'll have to take that, uh, those questions to the, to the break, I think. Um, I'd like to thank uh, each of you to have uh, leaders, industry leaders of your caliber uh, being as open as you have been with us is very, very valuable, and uh, we really appreciate it. So Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahman, Haroon, thank you for spending the time. It's been a really good, interesting insight, and I think there's some takeaways, both in terms of uh, more efficient use of fertilizers and how we can sustainably produce these products that people can really um, action uh, and see actioned in their own businesses. So thank you. Please join me in thanking this expert panel. Thank you. Thank you.